to be able to welcome back Dr. Raja Mukherjee. Uh, Raja is generally recognised as the leading specialist in FASD in the UK. He is a consultant psychiatrist and internationally acclaimed expert of FASD. And thank you so much for joining us again tonight, Raja. You're more than welcome. Lovely to see you. Now, can I start, first of all, by saying that 2022 has been quite quite a year for the FASD community. Can you explain the significant events that have happened this year? So it's been quite a lot, actually, if you think yeah. about it. So going back to this time last year, we were hosting a whole load of the roundtable meetings, which I know you came to quite a few of them, leading to March having the roundtable launch, although I couldn't make it because I had COVID. Um, but that was still a good thing. We had nice quality standards came out at the same just before that. So we were able to link the two things together, which was really good. Um, the year before we'd had the, the NHS England um, document had come out. So the three things in that space of time is really good. I know it's not 22, but I'm going to bring it in anyway. Um, but there was those three things at the start of the year was really helpful. And then we use that to build on different piece of information. So different areas started to then implement strategies, look at their own needs and try to set up different pathways. So Sheffield and Manchester are well progressed down there. Brighton have done some work around it. We've had conversations with various other places around the country who are thinking about how they can deliver their quality standards and what they're doing about it. So that's all changed. Kent obviously is well established and down the route working with us. And so you're involved in that as well. We've done a couple of trainings now with them in the last year. We've got another one booked for early next year to try and increase the, the level. Then our pediatricians and other uh, are trying to engage and we've got clinics where we're doing supervision. So that's increasing, seems to be going well. It's not being used as much as it could be, but it's growing and that's improving. So there's been a lot of progression from different factors, but the key parts were at the start of the year, I think. Um, oh, the other highlight for me was obviously we got to go back to the European FASD conference and see old friends again and be in person with people in Norway. That was lovely. Um, and so that was a quite a highlight for me on the FASD calendar. Absolutely. And one of the impacts that we've seen and we, you know, we've all anticipated the nice quality standards coming out and they were delayed, but finally they came out and actually probably the delay was convenient because it allowed us with those roundtables to produce <coughs> that excellent document. The time is now. Mm. And one of the areas that it really focused on was the area of diagnosis, because Many of the questions that we've been asked are, how do you diagnose for FASD? Are there any biochemical um, tests that can be done where they can check if a child has FASD in the womb? What sort of tests are there for the future? You know, a lot of these areas. Can you explain a little bit about the process of the diagnosis, how we have to get this diagnosis on a clinical level to start with? And then maybe we can look at it in the layman's terms as okay. we as we do. So the first thing to say is FASD is a diagnosis of inclusion. You have to get the factors to rule the bits in and exclusion. You have to rule things out. It is one of these conditions that mimics so many different things because it is when I, when you drink alcohol during pregnancy, it's, it's a pretty broad brush chemical and causes damage to structures midline front to back. And so any of the pathways through the brain that can be affected there will present in those kind of ways. You know, we did the paper, which is fairly famous now about the 428 different conditions. You know, that was a big piece of work that we were part of. Um, but they are, that doesn't mean everybody's gonna have 428 conditions. It means that these are associated and there are factors that are happening that will lead to that occurring in a certain proportion. Can I come in so, on that just for a second? Sorry to interrupt, but those co comorbidities, yeah. they, um, a lot of people mention, and you're a specialist in ASD and ADHD as well. So yeah. can you delve into that as well? Yeah, yeah. So, so think about what I was saying before about the brain pathways being damaged. Okay. Whether it's genetics, teratogenic conditions like FASD, the brain 
what we we have are pathways in the brain that coordinate different functions okay and so if you have an let's call it an inhibitory control pathway the thing that stops you doing something but you damage it whether it's a genetic cause or it's a teratogenic cause you've damaged that pathway yeah mm -hmm. and so if you have a social communication part of your brain which deals with how you perceive things how you interact if you have a genetic cause that affects that pathway or a teratogenic cause you're still causing damage to the pathway now the difference is if you have a genetic syndrome and a path that there are certain bits that may be affected whereas with a different syndrome you know you may overlap some bits of it but not all of it so you have differences even then between these conditions and that's where FASD comes into its own phenotype is that it will be damaging certain areas of the brain more than others so therefore you've got areas which still work and areas that don't work at all um, and so and the extent of that damage will vary between people so that's why you get differences in presentation based on that so ADHD and ASD are outcomes okay and so if you have those inhibitory control pathways damaged uh, you can't stop yourself you're inattentive your motor problems are there you get this thing we call ADHD if your social communication pathways are damaged and you have rigidities you have this thing we called autism and as I've just said whether it's a genetic condition that leads to it or here a teratogenic condition i.e. FASD caused by alcohol that leads to it these outcomes can still be seen and so it's to do with what pathways in the brain are affected and how they then present themselves. And the cause of that, in this case, is the alcohol that's causing the damage. And that's the relationship between them, um, thinking about etiology and outcome. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And one of the, a lot of people want to understand how, when you diagnose, do you think <coughs> that, pediatricians have been reluctant to diagnose for FASD because they understand these other syndromes and the comorbidities, but they don't understand the complexities of FASD. Um, there's a lot of reasons why people may or may not diagnose. Your previous question about biochemical tests, there isn't a specific test you can look at. And so, and that's the problem. When you do looking for genetics, for example, you're ruling things out. That's the ruling out bit. Um, so what are the reluctances for people is there's, there's two big ones. One is you're trained in a period where you're told the face is everything and it's not. Um, it represents around two to 5% of people have full facial stigmata. Um, and so the facial features are quite rare, actually, in terms of the whole spectrum of it. The second thing is there's this concern about stigma and addressing that issue, whereas we know that actually most of the research would point to the fact that people are presenting to clinics, to pediatricians, because they know there's something not quite right with the child. Um, whether that's a birth mum or whether it's a foster parent or an adoptive parent, they're going to seek help not because they think the, the kid's fine and there's no problems at all. They're going because there's something not quite right. And there's something that they need help with, you know, and, and that's why they're presenting. So there is something in people's brains already saying, look, I just want to get help. I don't care what it is. I want to get help. When you get the answer of what it might be, there is a period of grief which will occur, but that can happen for many reasons. Even if it's nothing to do with FASD, if it's a genetic condition, there is a period of grief and the loss of the of the perfect child, in quote marks, because that's what people, every everybody aspires to, is you have your perfect child. And when you find that there's something that's not quite right in terms of how they function or something that's going to cause them lifelong difficulties, that that will happen anyway. And so it's never about blame. It's never about trying to work it out but that fear of the grief and the fear of what will happen puts people off and the stigma therefore arises whereas what we should be doing is realizing actually our primary responsibility is to help the child understand itself to have a better long-term quality of life and the family to have a better long-term quality of life and that actually part of that is supporting them through that process of grief to resolution to allow them to have a better ongoing care um, and different people you meet will be in different parts of that journey um, and there's that that stigma kind of still perpetuates because people are afraid of what people will say should you go there and in the past we the, the one of the things that kept coming up was well there's nothing you can do about it well we know there is things you can do about it now um, and so that will be a change as well in terms of how things work
We did have um, Jan and Rossi who mm -hmm. were able to give, an, as they always do, the most brilliant explanation of how to sort of gradually, every time you hear them speak, and <coughs> we work with birth mothers in our, um, in our clinics and in the, our um, support groups, we frequently feel that every time that it's being mentioned, every time that their stories are being told, every time our lived experiences are being broadcast on our webinars and others, and you bring us in to work with the pediatricians and um, talk about that lived experience, it gradually diminishes, I feel, the stigma that is attached mm. to it. And I think this is a really important point. But can we go back to the actual process of diagnosis? There may yep. be many here that um, have come on really not knowing how to get a diagnosis or have been waiting for such a long time or are not being <laughs> referred to them. Can you talk a bit about that side of it and okay. what the future holds? So let's talk about what we do now and then we'll talk about the future in a second, if that's right. Absolutely. So in terms of what you do now, the first step is getting your GP on side. Because a referral to a pathway and a process starts with getting a primary care clinician to buy into what you're saying and seeking help. So you need a good GP who's going to be on your side, who's going to support you, believe you, and take your case forward. You're then going to be referred probably to a local pediatrician because the diagnosis is too complex for a, um, a single GP. They're, they're what most GPs will be is good at a lot of things but not have a huge amount of depth um, about one subject area whereas this needs a lot more depth because it's more complex in terms of diagnosis. Pediatricians will then see you and they will try and evaluate what's going on if they've got a new developmental pathway it may go down that route it may go down a physical health pathway depending on what the main issue is um, and most kids with FASD don't present for FASD they present because there's a problem or a difficulty and it's question mark why and so you're going to be seen down one of these different routes then it's about getting the information and trying to present that so you've got that so if, if people want to go in pre-warned and pre-armed is getting as much information as you can before about the different factors the difficulties almost kind of listing it writing it out and so you've got that list to give to people and so there is something that they've they've got access to then hopefully if you've got the right pediatrician they've got some knowledge about this they'll be able to say okay you've got this this and this kind of factors we need to do some testing and we'll see whether or not it's something that we can manage or whether it's more complex and we need to refer up to a, a more specialist end now if you're in kent like you are you know what they will do is your local pediatric service will will book in a contra a supervision with us we will discuss the case and we'll say look you guys need to do x y and z that will then bring it back to supervision and we'll sign it off with you can i just ask um when you say with us that's your practice yeah can you explain so, a little bit about your practice? Just very so quick. Hub and, Sp Hub and Spoke model of service delivery is about basically specialists like us supervising local pediatricians who've got less expertise. And then what we do is called gatekeeping is the more complex people are reviewed and we decide actually that's more complex than you can manage because there's other things going on. We'll see them. You keep the more straightforward ones where you don't need to come and see us because that's that's the more complex end where is because there's more things going on you have to pull things apart more you need better resources to do more testing um whereas the pediatricians will have limited resource the thing to bear in mind is that health service you've seen the strikes today and all the other things that are going on with the nurses the health services doesn't have enough money simple as that um, and so there are choices that people are making all the time and so what you need to do is try and be as efficient with the money as you can be and try and get as much out of as little as possible. And so for more straightforward cases, where I mean straightforward, is where it, the findings are easy to identify, where there isn't a lot of other things going on, can probably be seen locally by a pediatrician with a few extra measures supported by us, and they can hold it and manage it. And that hopefully means that you just go to see the local hospital, you never have to go anywhere else, you get the help and support, that's what should happen. Now, a lot of places, they don't have that in place yet, as you'll go down new developmental pathways and they say, well, we only deal with ASD and ADHD. We don't see anything else. Um, and it depends on 
on what that local process is. Um, and that's what's changing is slowly people are looking at the nice guidance, they're realizing they need to do stuff, and they're realizing actually what we're doing is trying to work out pathways. And they're realizing also that within these ASD and ADHD pathways, they've got a whole load of people who actually may well be um, caused by prenatal alcohol and maybe an FASD case. Um, so they're seeing them anyway. Um, if you're in the looked after children's group or in the post order type services, they're very much recognizing that this is a big issue um, and they're starting to do it. So GP first, local service. If the local service can't manage it, then they will refer on to more specialists. If there's a relationship like Kent, that's easy because it's just already established. If it's not the case and they actually don't have a formal relationship with a specialist service like ours, then they're going to have to look around and say, well, who can deliver this? And there aren't many places yet who can do that. And so then what's called an out of area referral happens. So every health area has a small budget to send people to be seen in national centres where their local services don't actually have the ability to do it. And so they then have to get a referral to us. They have to agree the funding um, because obviously our salaries and other stuff have to be paid for, but the, the trust has to cover its costs. You know, it's not profit making, it's literally about covering costs. And they then arrange that all the stuff is done and they come to see us. The difficulty that we used to do is that we used to say you have to have genetic testing before you come to us to rule those things out. The rules have changed about genetic testing. So sometimes you can only get them done afterwards now, because if you identify there's a new developmental problem, possible autism, probably other things for unknown reasons, and we need to rule that out, you can then get testing. But beforehand, some places are now saying you can't have it just to rule out possible FASD because that's not one of our criteria and so we're still getting our head around how to navigate that bit of it but the ruling out part is still important then you come and get seen you get your full assessment you get your report you go away and hopefully if you've been referred by secondary care they will seek take that report and they will provide you with the support you need hopefully not everywhere gets that because there's a still a lack of understanding in many places as to what is needed, how to deliver that, um, and the the practical ability of, you know, there's a complexity here to, to supporting people. Now, some places around the country have used um, generic kind of, for example, neurodevelopmental ASD kind of support, where it doesn't quite work specifically. It's a good starting point, but it's not the end point for people with FASD. There's a difference. Then there are other places just don't have anything. And that's the challenge. And I hear from that all the time. Even uh, places like Scotland, for example, which is supposed to be of sorted it, still struggle at times mm -hmm. to get all of it done in a in a way that actually is efficient. And because it's down to different regions interpreting the rules differently, you get different levels of support. So you guys yeah. obviously are there supporting yeah. in Kent, but that doesn't happen everywhere. We had that with Tris um, from FSD Ireland, um, and he was explaining the work that they're doing over there to try and at least get it recognized at this yeah. point. Um, we hear frequently of um, different medical practitioners that don't <coughs> identify or do not see FSD as a disability. And in social care, wh what is your experience of this? Seeing FASD as a disability it depends on the individual. Um, and that's the challenge is <laughs> the problem with the whole term disability. What do we mean by that? You know, are you disabled because society doesn't make a reasonable adjustment towards you? You know, I've got a, a visual processing difficulty. I just take longer to read. Um, but I, I've obviously written papers and books and other stuff. So so it hasn't impaired me in the same kind of way. Um, somebody who's not able to function who can't live independently you know i would argue has a as a cognitive disability if that's what's causing it they may not have physical disabilities but they've clearly got an in a difficulty and a disability in living their life independently on their own so they need support and they need help um it comes down to what they're looking for and the definition of it most people you see with fsd don't have loads of physical disabilities not that are obvious anyway um 
it's the cognitive stuff and that's the bit that's hidden that's a bit that's missed and people don't always see it and so therefore you know when you go for these tests of disability living allowance and other bits and pieces they do your can you get can you get yourself dressed yes can you make your way down here on your own yes can you do drive a car yes can you do that yes can you plan on your own no but that doesn't matter because that's not relevant and and that's the challenge is what they're measuring is not the kind of problems that a lot of the kids had and this is the situation that many of our families and social workers want to understand as well is because it's about accessing the support and the services at that early <coughs> stage also the the level of support within education within the schools as well to be able to um access the disabilities team that's what is so many people require however you know there is the recommendation as well that you can go through the back door which is using adhd and asd diagnosis as well the neurodevelopmental um services so you know there are ways in certainly to hmm. accessing the disabilities team um can we go on to talk about once you have a diagnosis one of the questions that came up time and time again were what therapies do you recommend what therapies work now it's such a vast spectrum it's a big question but what sort of therapies in your experience have proved to be significantly beneficial so you can separate therapies into different groupings okay and so we're just literally starting our trial of a parenting intervention which is a parenting cog a parenting intervention around psychoeducation um there will be stuff coming out on social media very shortly about trying to recruit some people for that and that is about trying to if you educate the families how to manage kids better then you'll have a different perspective of of go what's going on and so there's something about education the people around the child around the adult okay then you've got the stuff around what can the individual themselves do uh, and that comes back to their own individual level. And so somebody who's got a severe intellectual disability, who's autistic, who's got, we're then going to struggle with certain, a lot of therapies in a way that somebody who's quite higher in their intellectual ability, who's got milder levels of social communication deficit, who's not quite so badly with their ADHD, you know, and us, as they will be much more likely to be engaged in a whole load of different types of therapy. So it depends. Um, Generally, what we suggest is that you need more psychoeducation approaches. So it's more pragmatic, more concrete, based on learning kind of approaches. Use what we call the privacy behavior support kind of approaches, PBS, where you're looking at the prevention of difficulties by self-recognition and also reactive strategies that can be used when things get out of control and then no longer. Because we understand there's an arousal aspect to to individuals with FASD is that when they're low arousal and they function okay, they're much more in control. They get stressed and, and they suddenly lose control. And so there's something about preventing that escalation to that. And again, that is a more, th it's a behavioral management approach. It's not ABA. It's not kind of trying to change people. It's about recognition of this is how people present. This is what their lives are like. This is the arousal. This is what it looks like. And this is what you can do. And so it's the structure. So that is actually a combination of both the people around them and the individual themselves learning to recognize themselves and working out. So it's a much more concrete kind of um, practical based approach, a psychoeducation approach, rather than the trying to understand your emotions and how do you feel and all those kind of stuff that doesn't work quite as well mm. especially in if they've got that more complex presentation the thing to bear in mind there are a lot of people out there who we probably don't see who have milder levels of presentation who just don't present to clinics who don't present with this level of severity of deficit because you know they may have alcohol exposure but it hasn't affected them to this to the nth degree that they are presenting with these problems because it's quite a wide spectrum um, and so therefore you've got people who will and you saw in the paper recently um, because there was that lovely story I don't know if you've seen it of of the lady who had I've forgotten her name unfortunately who had had done, done a master's degree had got some difficulties but with some adjustments had managed to do really well now somebody like that will probably do well with all types of therapy whereas somebody who's more disabled is probably going to need that psychoeducation approach so you tailor it to the person and the key thing if any if i take say anything is everybody's individual and you have to tailor it to that individual um and so there is no one thing that works for everybody it has to be tailored to that person and what their specific profile is 
And this was something that came in in the nice guidance, wasn't it? That crucial yeah. management plan, that fifth yeah. guidance. Can you talk about the, the post-diagnostics? Um, you mentioned there the therapies. How, first of all, how would people be able to access your family therapy that you would well, the, the parenting course yes the parenting course so so that's still a research trial at the moment and so there will be starting we, we're starting to recruit soon for that this is a middle phase of the whole overall package of what we're going to do um and so there'll be stuff coming out on social media and other stuff soon there'll be other places coming from certain cl our clinic and other clinics um where we're going to try and recruit from and so we will they'll that will be coming out and so if that if people see that and they're interested and they fit the criteria cause, because it's research is quite strict as to who the, who can be involved at this stage yeah. and we can only train so many people in once so there will be different points in time where we will take people into the to the group to training and there'll be some periods of people time where people have to wait before they get to be seen kind of thing because we can only do so much at once but that will be for this phase and there's about 120 people we want to try and test this on first and if that works then we can take it to a big trial and do it really properly um, but you have to prove before you get the research you have to get the money through proving that it can be delivered and so that's this middle phase now and so that will be coming out so if people are interested when that comes out then this keep space. an eye keep keep watch this space kind of thing and that's through the Salford group okay. um, but it will be happening the next month that we'll start to do this kind of stuff in terms of other therapies it depends on your local pathways and what's available um, and it does come down to a certain degree as as to what your local area has in place to deliver um, there are other therapies around the world, for example, uh, Mile, which is about maths. There's the bit about um, Alert program, which is about sensory modulation. There's the Parents First kind of thing, which is a, which is a year long course run by Christine Christy Petrenko over in the States. Um, and these are different things that can work, but are tailored again to the individual needs. So yeah. there's more therapies being proven to work for this group but they're not all necessarily available here because we haven't got the expertise, the experience, and people are not making the diagnosis as we talked about before. Yeah. And so, but the so what question as to what you do afterwards is being answered. And that's the first bit of the post-diagnostic support is if you can offer therapy and education and support, then the other stuff. The other thing I'd point always people to is about the, my FASD and me, you know, you, the website, which obviously Sandy and NoFaz with the Seashell Trust developed, I think that's great in terms of just learning about yourself a very simplistic way of the individual going down and it's worked for people even into their their adulthood that they can go on and whilst it's de developed for that middle age middle teen kind of age that younger to middle teen age um it's how you've and i'm sure you've seen it as well is older teenagers young adults finding it really useful to sit down and learn about themselves because what happens is we teach the adults and the families about FASD. We don't teach the kids. And when they become adolescents and adults, if they don't understand themselves and what keeps themselves safe, that's when they rebel. And that's when you get into problems with it because they need to basically understand what keeps them safe and how to manage themselves to a certain degree. So they don't own it themselves to a certain degree. They're going to push away from it. And the ones who have a little bit of ownership of, I have an issue, I need help at times, not all the time, but I need help at times are the ones who did better. And, you know, bringing that up, I, I think I should really also mention that we've got um, on our YouTube channel some of the FASD friendship groups that we've been running. Some of the adults with FASD, they talk about their experiences, their lived experiences and what they've learned through the process. And many of the younger children that have just recently got a diagnosis, <coughs> their families, their parents, their carers also watch those and take a lot of comfort from them as well, because in years gone by, it was a doom and gloom around FSD and it doesn't have to be. There are so many positive outcomes that can come. You know, one of the questions that came up earlier was what are the strengths and qualities of those living with FSD? Well, you know, look at our videos, Maggie May, we've mentioned before, we've had so many others that come and talk to our audience and try and educate on that side of it so absolutely i think that's an integral part of it now when we do talk about the management plan and the right approach to that now 
that can't be accessed in every area of the country. But there are so many different organizations around the country that understand your own area, understand the area, understand the limitations of your area and the strengths of your area. And to go to those people, those support groups, those clinics and have conversations with them because they can often steer you in the right direction but also they can educate you so the better educated you are to going to your EHCP plan at school going to your that first meeting with your local doctor that might not understand everything about FSD but if you're informed and you're able to discuss and use the language it absolutely goes a long way would you agree with that? And this is what we always say to people. The thing that families can do is to go with information. The more information you have, especially about the prenatal alcohol and the other factors that go on and the history of, of pregnancy, you know, are there other drugs involved? Is, uh, for example, we know that opiates don't cause the long term consequences on the brain in the same way that um, alcohol does. So if you can actually show what people have had, and the, what the lifestyles were, you can start to say, okay, this had an effect, this didn't have an effect. So the more information you've got, the better. Now that's often missing. But if you go armed with with all this kind of stuff and say, look, this is what we know, this is what we've got, this is the kind of problems we've got, this is what we've done, you know, it, and you put it down, they're often that all the information's there. When I, I always used to think when I first started this is that what we do with our reports is we collate all the information that's gone before. And so often it's all there, just nobody's pulled it together. Mm -hmm. And so a family, and that's, <laughs> you guys, and so those families are incredible at times. And you come with big lever arch folds and you go and little things. I love the people are so organized. So, right, which one do you want? And you pull out and say, all right, that, I've got that one in folder B and you turn it out. And, and it's so organized and it's all there. And if somebody just bothers to pull it together, you know, it is going to be there with the information. It's just about collating it, you know. And when we talk about, and we talked a lot about this in the Time Is Now document, is effectively what we do using a medical model is that we take a history, we do an examination, we send people for a whole load of examinations, investigations, you come back and we collate that information. So the investigations around, do they have blood tests, do they have chest x-ray, do that stuff, if you've got sputum culture, if you've got a cough, for example, and then you come to decide what the treatment is here, by going off and having all these other tests like psychological tests, communication tests, looking for ADHD and other stuff, and you pile it all together. All of a sudden you say, without having to do anything, I've got all the information I need to make a diagnosis. Um, and But just nobody's bothered to pull it together. So sometimes that's all you need. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm going to come on to education now because we have a lot of SENCOs. We have a lot of learning support assistants and they want to know how they can better support those those children. Now, again, you know, that we've done other videos on this as well. But in your experience, what what would you say is the best way to support an individual that has FASD? In the school setting. In a school setting for their future moving forward, particularly transitioning so, into, you know, into senior school as well. That's a crucial So there, Again, it comes back to the individual, but a lot of kids with FASD like to be liked. They want to be engaged. They want to learn. They want to be part of it, but they struggle. Um, and so if you have somebody whose language processing is poor, but they talk for, for England, you're going to miss the fact that they're not understanding. So you're giving them instructions they can't follow. They're therefore going to be inattentive and they're going to develop that sense of I'm a failure, which will feed through with them in terms of that secondary trauma that can happen uh, on top of it. So there's something about actually saying, how do we understand that child first? How do we make accommodations for their deficits? But it comes back to you need to understand that to a certain degree beforehand. Um, then you can say, like, if they need, for example, reinforcement with somebody to reminding them what to do and talking them through each step so they feel better about completing the task, great. That's what you need. If, if they're able to go with it and do things on their own, then you build on their strengths. Because you talked before about strength-based approaches, and that's what you need to do. You build on the strengths, you scaffold their weaknesses. Um, you know, if, this, if the issue is it's overstimulating, then put them in a position where they're at the front of the class or they're not going to have the space where they can get up and walk around and not disturb people. You know, give them those adjustments that allow them to make the most of their neurological functioning and support them in the bits that they can't do. So you get the best out of them, which is without disturbing everybody else in the class, if possible. 
because that's a big issue is they're seen as disruptive so they're excluded and so you're trying to do it in a way that is inclusive not exclusive um, do you know you know what you want know me but yeah, when I say yeah. that's probably not the right word anyway so and then what you would be thinking about is well actually when we're going up to secondary school there's going to be the, all these expectations do we think they can manage it if not what support do they need and I've always said that if you can work this out before they get to secondary school then it's the right approach and the right timing to get it done some people will need to go to a mainstream secondary because they're intelligent enough to be able to progress and they can actually go on so again the person in the press recently she dipped out to masters, you know, going to a special needs school was not right for them. Whereas somebody else who's got more of an intellectual disability, who can't function, needs a more individualized program of work, needs to go to a special needs school. And so it depends on the individual as to what's assessed. Now, I'm not an educationalist and, and you know, people would there say that the, the pedagogy of how to teach people is done by teachers, not by psychiatrists. Um, and and that's the, the thing is I can tell you what's going on with the brain, but then people like Karen Blackburn, um, Barry Carpenter, they're the people who can tell you this is how you teach it. And that's who I would look to to say, look, this is the teaching methods for it. But the adjustments that you can make in the class to take account of their neurological deficit is is something that everybody can take it on board. I think there's an increasing drive for schools to try and think about neurodevelopmental disorders more broadly and the principles that apply and work for autism and other, and other factors in the ADHD lessons can be applied here based upon modifying it to the individual need. And again, one of the really important aspects of this, and as a psychiatrist, you can sort of tap in on this, and it's the social pressures as well, the communications and the social. Can you talk a little bit about FASD and social interaction with your peers and others? So this is difficult yeah, because there are different types of presentation within the autistic spectrum, okay? Um, and so not everybody is your classic aloof child which i called hollywood autism which is the the person who's distant in the corner and so social communication deficits and difficulties is fairly inherent within the fasd because a lot of the pathways follow through frontal lobes and central pathways and you have to integrate cross hemisphere in order to deal with some of that and that goes wrong and so it's inherent in FASD that they're going to have difficulties with socialization and interaction. So it's the nature and degree, of, but they are pro-social. Most of them will want to be with others. They like the engagement. They just don't get it. They struggle to modify themselves to other people's needs, and they don't really take on board how the rules and responsibilities that come with being part of a group because they see things through blinkers, they see through things with their own lenses. Now, if you, and I was, I, I was talking to a psychiatrist, a paediatrician actually in Wales, just two days ago when I was doing a supervision, because we do supervisions with people across the country, any practitioner who's interested or wants to book in to talk to us, just contacts our secretary and we'll book in a session as a one-off. Um, and so I was talking to somebody in Wales, they wanted some opinion on a case, and they and the sort of saying, is there any ASD in this case? And say, oh, no, not at all. And then we went through it and they said, oh, maybe there is. Um, and because it's different. And, and so social interaction is a core deficit. Now, even if it's sub-threshold for the full diagnosis, there are often difficulties. And if you get emotional arousal, those difficulties suddenly become, I can't do it anymore. And so it's not a full diagnosis of autism, but it is a difficulty which will impair them in times of over-arousal. And so I can interact with you on a one-to-one. -one. I can make adjustments when I'm calm, but I can't when I'm stressed. And so because of those pathways in the brain being affected, it is a core deficit, but it doesn't look typical. So people don't recognize it. Then what happens is the expectations on the individual increase. The wishes of the individual themselves are that they want to be typical. They want to function in a typical way. They want friends. They want to engage, but they don't get why they're not. They don't get why they're being rejected. They're quite vulnerable. And Alan Price, who's my PhD, was my PhD student now, um, Dr. Alan Price, um, and our colleague who's working with us as part of the team now, um, is was was able to demonstrate the level of vulnerability that these individuals have to being exploited into secondary issues, into adverse childhood experiences, and to subsequent trauma. And so that whole perception of I'm rejected, why am I rejected, I don't get it, just builds up. 
um, and that just then leads to an, an extra layer of of rejection and fear and then that whole wanting to get away from it so it's a really complex interplay between the neurological deficits that are inherent and then the living of life which can then affect them because life doesn't meet their needs or expectations and so preventing it is about understanding what to do putting things in place have child up so kind of child up friendship training so people around them who can help support them who will understand them even children being explained actually they may struggle but just let, let them off a little bit of time because you know they, they, if you get them in the right way they can be really engaging um all these kids and these adults but they don't always see it from somebody else's point of view so if you expect that you're going to struggle and that's why they get rejected and they struggle with social interaction it's again down to pathways and the areas of the brain that deal with this kind of stuff and the fact that this has been damaged because the central parts of the brain are affected while we're on the subject of pathways and there are there are so many concerns that we hear frequently and it's something that i think needs to have a bit more of a discussion on and you're <coughs> the man for that and it's the predisposition to addictions what's the risk of an addiction to ethanol um well the the, paper, the literature would say about a third would would go on to have their own addictions with alcohol in terms of that strike study which has followed up and that continues um there's lots of theories behind why you may or may not develop it from an innate biological craving towards it but that's only seen in animal studies it's never been replicated in humans to the fact that again if you think about what i said before the frontal lobes are damaged so your your inhibitory centers the things that stops you that makes you think and th what what's going to happen is in those frontal lobes they don't work as well and so if you start something and let's say you're having a drink what you're doing is then exacerbating that loss of inhibition so you can't stop yourself even more so you just carries on uh, and then the same innate need of the physical and the biological kicks in if you've also got all those complex traumas on top that we've talked about and um, that stops you worrying about that and it reduces your anxiety because what alcohol does it works on what we call gabaminergic circuitry so gaba is the same thing as is the same circuitry that valium works on it's the same thing that that all benzodiazepine work on it reduces stress and anxiety you know it relaxes you that's why you feel relaxed and chilled out it disinhibits you because of that it makes you more impulsive because you don't you lose that control center and so all of these things together kind of combine to making you more vulnerable um and so and so i'll quote somebody who was an adult with L, with fasd said once i'd had one i couldn't have i'd have 10 because i couldn't stop because i just poured the next one without even thinking because that inhibition and that pause went in the same way an alcoholic says i can never touch it because i'm always an alcoholic there is always that vulnerability to it within this group because of that so the best thing to say is if you're not able to control it at all just don't go there you know if you're if you're one of these where you have that level of control you can have one or two and then stop that's fine if you've got somebody externally watching you say no you've had enough and you believe them and you trust them that's fine but if you're on your own and you can't don't do it because it's the easiest and safest way forward because actually that's the whole nature of how their brains are affected is their ability to self-regulate and self-monitor and to inhibit themselves is limited by the fact that that part of the brain is particularly affected. It, on the, a similar subject, the intolerances, for example, with foods, this is something that is very common, isn't it, with a lot of um, individuals with FSD. What are the most common intolerances to food and eating issues that you come across? So that's really variable because we get a lot of people where there's no difficulties at all. Yeah. Um, and so so there's a lot of issues where people um, just they, they eat too much. They they like their food. They really enjoy it. There are other people where it is very much restricted to I will only eat this type of food. I'll eat this kind of situation. And that, again, comes into how how restricted their brains are in terms of being able to shift being able to tolerate it and so it depends is there a biological or a physical thing that they can't tolerate certain textures certain taste 
possibly in some, but it's not in everybody. And that's the inconsistency of, in this kind of thing, is the level and nature of that individualization there will vary. Um, and so, um, you know, I, we could take 100 people and a lot, most of them will actually probably not have a problem with it. But where it is a problem, it really becomes a real issue, you know, and you see that also in non non FASD cases where there's genetic issues with food and intolerance when you see it it becomes a real problem because food is so innate into our lives and so it becomes a restrictive pattern or they'll only eat certain textures or certain things then that sensory issue part of it which is core becomes much more of a feature but that is variable because the the most classic type of uh, presentation is a sensory seeking and an auditory filtering kind of presentation what we've seemed to have found is that the tactile sensitivities, for example, are more exacerbated by some of the drugs rather than just alcohol on its own. Um, and so some of these other things may be due to polysubstance factors or other bits um, and, and a complex interplay of other stuff. But trying to pull all that apart is not straightforward, but it's not consistent that everybody's going to have eating problems. Some will, some won't. And that many of them could be related to comorbidities as yeah, well. Absolutely. Um, you and I have had long discussions on this and we've filmed on it and, and it's with our connection with FASD within the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. It's understanding the vulnerability and, you know, you've touched on it there also with the addiction and being able to not notice and observe your own urges, let's say. So can you tell us about the risks that why so many get involved within the criminal justice system and their vulnerabilities lead them down that path? Um, okay. So again, it's another complex answer because there's no one single reason why people have that happens to people. Um, partly it's because the criminal aid gangs, the criminal element, let's say, see the vulnerabilities in these guys and they take advantage. And so more able individuals use these individuals almost as cuckoos or other factors to try and make them be their stooges or whatever. The other thing is that they, you get a lot of attention. And these, again, we've already said that yeah. kids with kids and adults with FASD like being part of the group. They like to feel wanted. They want to engage. They don't want to be part rejected. So all of a sudden you get all this praise and the other stuff people have doing it but you're not seeing the thinking about the consequences you're not thinking down the line this is going to be i'm going to get into trouble you know i'm going to be having a, a kind of um, one of these guys with machetes coming around trying to enforce uh, the fact that why have you lost your the drugs that you're trying to sell for us kind of thing they're not thinking about that when people are giving them the other stuff um and so you get drawn down to it and then you're stuck because when you're stuck in it you're stuck in it you know and then that vulnerability forces you down a route which is hard to get out of um it's that's just one element there's another thing that for example lower level stuff um you know you just see something you want it so you take it without thinking because you're not again thinking about consequences you know you're acting in the here and now and you're not thinking actually this belongs to somebody else i just need that so i'm going to take it um and so there's an element that that's innate with some people it's not that you're innate to be involved in the criminal justice system it's just that the laws that exist are not always understood or thought about when people are acting. Um, there is a vulnerability that people have to this. They can fabulate, they make things up. Some of the research that Gilbert's doing, uh, sort of our student in Manchester, PhD student, is doing some really good look, research looking at suggestibility and, uh, and confabulation uh, and showing that that's a really, really common thing um, in this population and actually having the evidence now to prove that that's the case more than just a speculation and suspicion that that's now being proven. Um, and that is, um, again, something which actually you get stuck in a system because you get, you kind of want to, to, to please, you want to say the right things, you make up stories which don't quite fit, but gets you into trouble without you realizing it. And so there's a really complicated reason why that kind of stuff happens, but a lot of it stems from not really thinking through longer term consequences and acting in the moment. Thank you. Yeah, I think summing up everything in a very layman's terms, uh, what what you've been suggesting throughout today is clearly the we like to work on a positive. It's clearly understand 
understand the individual, understand yeah. the limitations, understand where it comes from, yeah. what has happened, where their limitations are, and be able to work with them, scaffold them, support yeah. them. So we want to change a deficit-based model, i.e. let's focus on their problems, to a strength-based model, let's focus on their strengths. Um, and so what you say is like, like you've got guitars behind you. We were talking about that before. Music is something that a lot of them are very good at. You've seen the the mm -hmm. song that's been produced. There's lots of people who find art quite because some of those lateral centers, these things on the edge are preserved. So they've got a lot of strengths in those kind of things. So using that helps self-esteem, helps them develop things, gives them a group to belong to rather than focusing on the deficits. But you're absolutely right. If you focus on the person, on the individual, work them out, lets them build on their strengths long-term outcomes are far better absolutely and so often we we have um questions around the transition from child services going into adult services that whole cliff edge again if you've got the scaffolding supporting that individual in social care it it, it disappears frequently what if you could do anything for child services transitioning into adult services that would change that, what would be something that would come to your mind would be the one thing that would help with that? So this isn't going to be a service related change. This is about how families and individuals understand themselves. So there's a drip, drip, drip from a very early age to the point that the person themselves owns their own issues and so they know that they've got difficulties and that they know that they need to get help because a lot of the biggest problems when they transition to adulthood revolves around the change in the law who gets to decide and then capacity decision making all the other stuff and the arguments between these kind of factors whereas if the individual drip 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 from an early age starts to embed in themselves look i need to ask for help when i'm struggling and that simply is the case and that and they do use that to protect themselves longer term you know they're the ones that do better and they can transition from childhood to adulthood but still know they need to ask the help of the supporters around them and you look around at people's stories the ones who are asking for help who recognize that they've got issues and they want to get support are the ones who've got better outcomes and the ones who reject it, who don't want to have FASD, who don't like it, they don't accept it yet, and they're just trying to reject it and function in a neurotypical way, which they can't, they're the ones who get into trouble. Roger, I think that's a perfect ending. Thank you so much for your time tonight and your wisdom and input and advice to so many. Thank you all for joining us um, again for this fascinating webinar. It will be there's so much information in there that um, I think many of you will want to dig into it again and recap um, some of uh, some of those little nuggets of information. So it will be on our YouTube channel um, within a couple of days. So please share it around the communities, around your friends and those that want to understand better. In the meantime, uh, on behalf of everybody here tonight, uh, thank you again, Raja, for all the work that you are doing and for supporting all of those uh, in the community. Thanks very much indeed. Have a lovely Christmas. All the best. Bye.